So as of this week, we'll start to look more at solutions, various proposed solutions to the problems that we've been talking about. But lying within these solutions, there are still going to be deep systemic critiques, some of which we've already studied and some of which will be new. So we'll have to talk about the underlying assumptions of some of these authors. Specifically, we'll be looking at accelerationism this week, and we'll be looking at that from the left. There's left-wing accelerationism and right-wing accelerationism, um, but we'll be reading um, the Accelerate Manifesto, um, and that comes from the perspective of the left. But then we will turn to a perspective from the right, which has something akin with accelerationism, but um, is definitely akin with uh, the futurism of accelerationism. If that's too many isms, don't worry, there'll be an explanation. So from the right-wing perspective, we have a selection from Guillaume Fay um, from a book he wrote called Archaeofuturism. And just to make things really interesting, we're also reading a chapter out of a book called Ecofascism, Lessons from the German Experience, by Peter Staudenmeier. So this is where this class starts to get hopefully pretty interesting because we this is a political thought class and so while the subject is environment and food systems um, we're going to be bringing in a lot of interesting ideologies and um, proposals many of which you may not be familiar with uh, but at some point down the road you may become more familiar with because a lot of them are um, forward-thinking, you might say. So the Manifesto for an Accelerationist Politics came out in 2013. It's by two American authors, Nick Schnurichek and Alex Williams. That first name has three consonants um, at the beginning of it. Overall, the idea behind this manifesto is that um, the traditional left in American politics and maybe Western democratic politics more generally hasn't really been able to stand up to uh, the right, particularly to uh, the forces um, of neoliberalism. Neoliberalism being that ideology that supports free markets, and global capitalism, with the idea that the more development and the more economic growth, the better for everybody. These authors seem to think that the traditional left um, have been rather bowled over by the right and uh, have not been able to hold their own. And so this, this uh, manifesto is a pretty highly philosophic um, proposal for how to change that. You may remember that Chris Hedges made a similar point about um, what he called the liberal class um, not being able to really um, affect much change and in a way being having been co-opted um, by larger economic forces unable to stand their ground. So they start out with a pretty dire um, proclamation that we are facing cataclysms or apocalypses um, that have been caused by capitalism that is more or less out of control. And I, I mean that literally. They think that um, a big part of the problem is that the innovations of um, the current system are out of, con out of the control of people, so they cannot be purposed for the good of people. They quickly go through some of the problems that this has caused. They talk about uh, the climate problems, um, you know, global warming. And they talk about how um, human population has increased and there's lots of threats facing people because of the increase in population. Um, they say especially in water and energy reserves. They talk about the financial crises that happened in 2007-2008 and uh, discuss that um, as something that's kind of going to continue or going to happen again as long as the basic system remains the same. And they talk about how increasing automation in almost every area 
um, creates this glut of people who don't have enough to do or, or are, are employed, underemployed. If you've studied Marx, you know that Marx and Engels warned of crises of overproduction and underconsumption because the capitalist system in its quest for efficiency puts people out of work. So I, I rather think that they're um, thinking of that critique in the first part of this manifesto. They make mention of neoliberalism 2.0, which is a next higher phase of the neoliberal project from their perspective, where in addition to um, aggressively promoting um, free market development around the globe, um, there's a certain melding of the public and private sectors. They call it new and aggressive incursions by the private sector into what remains of social democratic institutions and services. But um, you could flip that around as well. There's been such a reach of, of uh, government into the private sector, as we talked about, um, with our prime example being the agricultural sector. So in criticism of the left, they say 30 years of neoliberalism have rendered most left-leaning political parties bereft of radical thought, hollowed out, and without a popular mandate. Basically, they say they either follow the old ways and the old methods, which are of protest and, and politics, which are not, um, not good enough. They, they are not good enough to push back against neoliberalism. Or they go for what they call neo-primitivist localism. And that's the tendency of withdrawal to basically say, well, we can't really, we can't really change the system, the economic system per se, but we can withdraw from it and we can create, um, you know, smaller uh, communities where we live very differently. They don't like either of those two systems. And the reason why, or those two ideas, the reason why is because they do have this notion about technology that is different from a lot of, of a lot of people, especially maybe a lot of liberals at this point, um, and that is that there's nothing essentially wrong with technology. It's how it's being used, and they argue that capitalism has um, is no longer using it well. That in fact, capitalism is holding back the constructive development of technology. Capitalism, they say, has basically made technology a problem. It, it creates this out-of-control growth. It creates lots of things people don't need. It creates too much pollution. And all of these things they blame on the logic of capitalism, whereas technology itself could be used appropriately to actually solve a lot of the problems caused by capitalism. They briefly criticize a right-wing accelerationist, Nick Land, who seems to argue, I've only read a little bit of Nick Land, so I'm, I can't really totally um, characterize his thought, but he seems to argue for ramping up capitalist development with the idea that we will someday reach a, a desired goal of total automation, which I believe is what they're talking about when they say technological singularity. Then they briefly turn to Marx and Marxism as another form of accelerationism that they don't like. So basically they've argued that neoliberalism is a form of acceleration, um, which they don't like, the acceleration of capitalism. And then another form of accelerationism they don't like is Marxism and communism. And it's true what they say about Marx, and I try to teach this in my classes, Marx and Engels really rather loved um, the technology that was produced by capitalism. They said that communism would be able to use that technology better because it could be used with planning to benefit human beings. But um, in the end, our authors of this manifesto uh, are not in agreement with either of these two accelerationisms, either capitalism or communism, which they both see, they see both of them as having proven themselves wrong by their outcomes. Um, in the case of capitalism, we already know what they think. In the case of communism, what we got was 
totalitarianism and we got actually a whole lot of environmental uh, degradation as well. So both of those two systems um, were failures in the eyes of, of these authors. Now they get to their accelerationism. Now you would think that maybe a, another person might conclude, well, we have two examples of accelerationisms, uh, capitalism and communism, neither one of which have proven, um, proven to work. They've been disastrous in the eyes of, of these authors. Why should we put our money on accelerationism then? Um, they want to, so how they argue for their own position is they, they say um, that we can single out technological development, that we can separate it out from either of these two political systems, political and economic systems, and look at it separately. They say of themselves, accelerationists want to unleash latent productive forces. In this project, the material platform of neoliberalism does not need to be destroyed, it needs to be repurposed towards common ends. The existing infrastructure is not a capitalist stage to be smashed, but a springboard to launch towards post-capitalism. And that's a term that they use quite a bit, post-capitalism. They say, given the enslavement of techno-science to capitalist objectives, we surely do not yet know what a modern techno-social body can do. Again, somebody else might argue, um, if we don't know what a modern techno-social body can do, um, maybe we ought to be a little hesitant to plunge full bore into that future, but um, I guess what I'm trying to say is I detect a certain latent faith in progress in, this, uh, in these authors, even though they have just acknowledged that previous forms of that same faith and progress have gone terribly wrong. But they say what we are arguing for is not techno-utopianism, okay? They're, they're trying to ward off that criticism by, by proclaiming that they're not looking to some sort of futuristic utopia. They back that up with this sentence. They say, whereas the techno-utopians argue for acceleration on the basis that it will automatically overcome social conflict, our position is that technology should be accelerated precisely because it is needed in order to win social conflicts. Now, what exactly they mean by that, I'm not sure, because I don't believe they elaborate on that, but they, they want to distance themselves from this notion that if, if we reach some sort of technical perfection, all social conflict will cease and will finally, um, you know, achieve total harmony. They then turn to how the left needs to use technological and scientific advances that are made that have been made possible by capitalist society. Um, but I don't think that's what they're referring to in the in the quote I just gave, um, unless they're just being clever about that. I'm not sure. But next they get into some of the ways that the left can uh, start to win its arguments and to win back people's um, hearts and minds, you might say. They talk about how they need to understand and use economic modeling, for instance. Um, they must think in terms of economic and social experimentation. And maybe most importantly of all, they need to develop a new type of ideology, something that's much stronger and much less close to neoliberalism, because I fancy that they think that um, the, the mainstream left-wing, um, such as the Democratic Party, is too close to the right wing and doesn't really present um, a, a good alternative, a real solid, attractive alternative. They cri critique some of the old methods of the left of marching, holding signs, and establishing temporary autonomous zones. I believe they're referring to Occupy, the Occupy Wall Street movement, Occupy generally. 
And one of the most interesting things they say is that um, the left needs to get over this notion that that everybody must be equally and democratically um, included and that there needs to be complete transparency in decision making and it must all be very, very horizontal, as, as they put it. Um, I think they don't think that that provides enough leadership and it tends to lead to meandering and a lack of focus and a lack of Oh, being inspirational enough to um, to gain adherence. So they actually end um, the 13th paragraph saying secrecy, verticality, and exclusion all have their place as well in effective political action. Also, even just as interesting, they redefine democracy here. They uh, seem to be rejecting um, the procedural notion of democracy, that in order for a, for something to qualify as a democracy, you have to have, uh, you know, voting elections, and um, there has to be means of redressing your grievances, you know, means of being heard, um, democratic bodies that meet and vote on laws. They say, in the 14th paragraph, real democracy must be defined by its goal, collective self-mastery. Um, this reminded me a bit of the communist idea of people's democracy. Um, Mao, for instance, uh, you know, thought of the communist movement that he instigated as very democratic, even though there was no procedural means for people to select their leaders or to change the goals of the leadership. The reason why it was democratic in Mao's eyes was because it was for the people. It was by the people in the sense that the people had created it through revolution and it was for the people in its approach. There weren't any procedural checks on that though. Um, as you know, in um, communism, both in the Soviet Union and China, um, sure, they had elections, um, but there was only one candidate, right? And so in a, there was no procedural democracy. Um, and in fact, the communists tended to be very suspicious of procedural democracy because of how easily they thought it could be manipulated by the wealthy, in, uh, at least in the capitalist countries. It could be manipulated by the wealthy, by the people who had the most financial power. So next, uh, the authors say we have three medium-term concrete goals. The first goal, they say, we need to build an intellectual infrastructure. So here again is this um, a restatement of the fact that they think that the, the existing liberal uh, scene is not intellectually rigorous and doesn't present a real um, compelling alternative to the neoliberal full-blown theory that's been promoted by the right for decades. Second, they say we need to construct wide-scale media reform. They want to um, use the media very effectively. Again, this sounds like an answer to the neoliberal um, means of using the media. Um, there's no getting around uh, the fact that the conservative forces, as we under, as we call conservative forces in the United States, um, have become very, very good at all levels of communication, um, from you know television to, uh, news to radio to the internet. Um, in every way, they 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 have become masters of the media. And so these authors are saying um, the left needs to, to wrest those resources back, so to speak. And then third, they say we need to reconstitute various forms of class power. In the economy as it exists now, there is no uh, unified global proletariat, as they say, meaning there's no, you know, unified underclass um, ready to jump on board, they say we must knit together a disparate array of partial proletarian identities, often embodied in post-Fordist forms of precarious labor. Well, that's a sentence, isn't it? <laughs> but 
<clears throat> when they when they say post Fordist, what they're referring to there is um, the notions you know sort of embodied or encapsulated in the ideas of Henry Ford, the guy that started the Fo Ford you know auto manufacturing. Um, that you know well, we, we create these uh, factories. And the factories will take care of people, will make sure that people have a living wage, that the workplace is accommodating and safe, and etc. Well, one could argue those were always ideals, but what they're saying is now we're in a post-Fordist uh, economy in which most people don't work in factories, and most of the factory labor has been um, that exists has now been moved to other countries where uh, very poor people. Um, work in them instead of Americans. Post-Fordist forms of precarious labor, well, I'm thinking Uber drivers, um, Airbnb hosts, the whole gig economy, um, people working full-time in office jobs that are barely making enough to um, feed their families, um, all sorts of people who are working multiple jobs in the service industry, um, so, I believe that's what they're talking about. These aren't people who identify as, quote, the working class. Um, and many of them are very conservative, actually. Uh, they don't think of themselves maybe primarily as members of some sort of economic class. So, what these authors are saying is that the left needs to work on providing that identity and knitting them together, showing them how they have a lot in common. And of course, let's not lose sight of the original accelerationist viewpoint as they see it. All of this development of left-wing politics and ideology and messaging and everything is, is going to be pointed towards um, this proposal that we go post-capitalist and that we have, in effect, the end of capitalist freedom and the institution of something like a technocracy, you know, the rule of technicians. So you can kind of ask yourself, think about what Jacques Ellul might have to say about this notion. When you think about it, he might not like it very much at all, right? These authors believe that progress can only happen if we do away with capitalism not in favor of some other political system, but in favor of technocracy. And we see earlier in the manifesto that they aren't really wedded to procedural democracy, um, and that to a certain extent they understand that in order to make great things happen requires top-down leadership, requires some, as they put it, verticality. They define accelerationism at the end as the basic belief that these capacities, that the capacities that have been unleashed by capitalism, can and should be set loose by moving beyond the limitations imposed by capitalist society. We know that they don't want to move into the false or, um, I guess, already known um, accelerationist system of old-style communism, but exactly what they have in mind other than some sort of technocracy, which, which, which I kind of tease out from between the lines here, they don't, they don't give um, any details about how exactly it would be run or how, what it would look like once the change happened, nor do they say whether the change will, will happen gradually or whether it will happen um, in, uh, in some sort of revolution. I like what they say near the end in, in uh, paragraph 22 when they say, after all, it is only a post-capitalist society made possible by an accelerationist politics which will ever be capable of delivering on the promissory note of the mid-20th century space programs to shift beyond a world of minimal technical upgrades towards all-encompassing change. I like that because it reminds us of, you know, the the you know the, the great um, possibilities that Americans envisioned when we first sent uh, man to the moon. For a long, long time, our space program 
had very little to do, well, had nothing to do with making money. Um, now I think it, I don't know, it probably still breaks even, I don't know. But for a long time it was hugely expensive and there wasn't any direct connection between the accomplishments in space and economic benefit. Um, those came along later, of course, like they always do with technological innovation. But there was an upswing in the imagination of people, you know, in the hope of people that, oh, if we can send a man to the moon, if we can figure out how to get out into space, surely we can solve a lot of, of problems, right? So they, uh, they, they hark back to that and kind of bring that forward. So they end on a fairly hopeful note, although they do say the choice facing us is either between that ex the type of accelerationism they're referring to and they're promoting, or, quote, a slow fragmentation towards primitivism, perpetual crisis, and planetary ecological collapse. So um, they give us a pretty dire warning there, but still... The tone in the last few paragraphs is hopeful. They say at the very end, what accelerationism pushes towards is a future that is more modern, an alternative modernity that neoliberalism is inherently unable to generate. The future must be cracked open once again, unfastening our horizons towards the universal possibilities of the outside. Outside the lines, I suppose. So there's a lot of things they don't um, address. And there isn't much um, going on in this manifesto about how the changes that may take place in the industrialized world or post-industrialized world, um, how those changes might impact people in other parts of the world that are at different stages, stages of economic development. Um, they don't make any mention of um, spirituality or religion. Uh, they don't really address racial, cultural issues at all and how this might help or hurt any of that. But then a manifesto doesn't do all those things and can't. This piece is designed to inspire um, and to start something. I think that the authors no doubt expected a whole lot more and have done a whole lot more along with other accelerationists uh, to flesh out that vision. But the Accelerationist Manifesto does do what it's intended to do, which is to present a new and rather bold alternative that breaks free from the traditional sort of bipolar uh, political mentality uh, of the American political scene. Accelerationism implies futurism, right? And so the next time um, I talk will be, I'll be talking about uh, Guillaume Fay's Archaeofuturism, which is a view of the future from the right. So I'll see you next time. Bye.